Then help speak brave for Asians, the captain of the gate. To every man upon this earth, death cometh soon or late. And how can men die better than facing fearful odds For the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods oh. At some point over the Atlantic, people began falling asleep. Marisol walked the length of the plane, closing window covers to darken the passenger area. Then she dimmed the lights. Sebakira rolled over onto her side, exposing her furry belly and snoring loudly as she took up a full row of seats. Ashling wanted to sleep, but couldn't. This airplane was one of the most unusual places she had ever been to, and everything about it felt wrong. She sat down in the first class area and started pawing at one of the touch screens in front of her seat. A blue and green shape flickered onto the screen in front of her, causing Ashling to startle. Huh? What's up? Bella grumbled. The CK3 developer was trying to sleep in another first class booth nearby, but was now looking over at Ashling. What's that? Ashling asked, pointing at the bright screen. That's a map of the world. Bella replied. Look, it actually shows where we are on the planet. Bella leaned over and pointed at the small, plane-shaped icon. We're over Scotland right now. See that island over there on our right? That's Ireland. That's your home. Ashley felt her heartbeat quicken. We're close to Ireland? She peered out the window again. Other side, fairy girl, Bella called out. Ashling scrambled out of her seat and made her way to the other side of the plane. She slammed the window cover open and scanned the horizon. She could barely see a dark smudge far away. The sun was setting over Ireland, its light reflecting off a distant surface, probably Loch Ney. How did we come so close to home without me knowing it? Ashling wondered. I should have known. Should have sensed something. Anything from the other world. Ashling watched the Irish coastline slip out of sight, and a few minutes later, the sun fell below the horizon, plunging the British Isles into darkness. Ashling's mind was full of darkness as well, as she tried to figure out just how or why her connection to the other world was suddenly gone. Marisol was awoken by the sound of Captain Yoshido's voice. He was gently shaking her by the shoulder. Wake up your friends and tell them we're about an hour away from Berlin, Yoshido said. ATC says their connecting flight is already waiting for them at the terminal. Marisol sat up, stretched her arms, and gave a great big yawn. Then she crossed her eyes, trying to examine a smudge on her glasses. Thanks, Marisol mumbled. I look terrible. Don't I? You look cute beyond all reason, Captain Yoshido replied. Promise you'll tell the whole story next time we fly together. I've just got to know. You've got a deal, Marisol said. You're going to be my therapist when this is all over. I don't think therapists screw their patients, Yoshido whispered in Marisol's ear. He leaned in closer and simultaneously kissed Marisol while groping her inner thigh. Marisol snorted, suppressing a cry of surprise. Whoa, save it for Tokyo Haneda, she whispered, trying to keep quiet. We can have fun after we save the world or whatever. What? If you're going to tease me, then I get to tease you back, Yoshido said playfully. He kissed Marisol again, this time groping her in a place where she was much more sensitive. Marisol held her breath and leaned into it, silently savoring the moment. And then she pushed Yoshido away, giggling. Go land the plane, pervert, she hissed. I'll see you when this is all over. While Captain Yoshido rejoined his colleagues in the cockpit, Marisol moved to the forward galley and found the light switch. When the lights came on, both the Creations and Paradox employees grumbled and complained, but followed Marisol's orders when she told them it was time to prepare for landing. 
Hang on. Where's Blake and Callie? Marisol said to herself. The reply came instantly. Waiting for you to move aside so we can put the coffee back on its shelf. Blake and Callie were jammed into the back of the galley, pressing themselves against the emergency exit to allow Marisol space to stand by the lighting controls. Blake was clutching some airplane food in both hands while Callie held a steaming mug of hot coffee in one hand and a thermos in the other. Sorry, Marisol squeaked as she allowed Blake and Callie to extricate themselves. I just wanted a snack, Blake said, munching on a spring roll. I wasn't ready to find Callie is turned into some kind of coffee fiend. Callie returned the thermos to its place on the shelf and quickly started guzzling the beverage. If I don't have coffee every morning, I will literally die, Callie declared between gulps. I know that feeling, Marisol giggled. The plane shifted under their feet. The final descent into Germany was underway. Callie went back to her seat, but Blake hesitated. He leaned in toward Marisol and whispered in her ear. So, it sounds like you're pretty close with Captain Yoshido. Have you inducted him into the Mile High Club yet? Marisol was too stunned to reply. Blake raised an eyebrow. Uh, that's one you've heard before, huh? Yep, I'll show myself out. Shaking his head at his failed joke, Blake returned to his seat down in the business class area. Right as he sat down, Marisol recovered. She reached into one of the galley drawers and retrieved a particularly thick copy of the Asiana Company magazine. Then she started walking down the aisle towards Blake, rolling the booklet into a baton shape as she went. Blake did not have time to ask what she was doing. As soon as Marisol reached his position, she lashed out, swatting Blake in the head with her rolled-up newspaper fifteen times before she was satisfied. When the plane landed, the tires made a squealing sound. Marisol peered out of her window and grumbled. It's raining here too? How bad can our luck be? She said. A team of German airport workers wheeled a set of boarding stairs toward the front doors, making contact as soon as the plane stopped near the terminal. Callie's team went first, disembarking and walking directly onto the tarmac. The creations followed with creators bringing up the rear. Conti was riding on Sabakira's shoulders, glaring at Blake. Emily held onto Blake's shoulders, peering around nervously at the surrounding cityscape and airport. The PDX plane is over there, on the far side, Callie called out, raising her voice to be heard over the noise of jet engines. Everyone follow me. Marisol stayed on the plane just long enough to make sure everyone had taken their backpacks with them. Then she disembarked after a short, non-verbal goodbye with Captain Yoshido. As she fell in line behind Sabakira, Marisol picked up on a growing sense of tension in the group. Conti, Trigg, and Sabakira were looking at one another as they walked. Or flew, in Conti's case. Marisol had read enough of Blake's stories to know that the Scions were having a telepathic conversation. At one point, Conti noticed Marisol's gaze and turned in midair, coming to land on Marisol's shoulder. While we are still far away from this second plane, let me share our concerns and ask for a clarification, Conti said. Uh, okay, Marisol said. What's up? Shepminter has been probing the minds of Varian and Mina. He has seen something we don't understand. Psionic After Effects. We thought you might know something about it. Marisol racked her brains. Their connecting flight, a much smaller Learjet, was now in view. Um, yeah, I helped Blake come up with the concept. It was part of the new system of psionic powers we created for Song of the Solitaire. Basically, characters in that story would set up their psi techniques on a delay, so that they could have influence and power over someone else for a, a very long time. Malam Ralpakin was supposed to be a master at that sort of thing. His telepathy could affect people decades later. Trigg's voice cut through the noise of the airport. That's why my mother's memories were blocked. Malam still had a hold on her mind after fifteen years, he said. Yeah, that's right, 
Marisol replied. Blake and I agreed this ability was the thing that would make Malum a different and more dangerous villain than Akira Robinson. Blake was really worried the readers would not take Malum seriously as a villain because he was going to follow in Akira's footsteps. We wanted to make him stand out. Well, congratulations! Varian replied in a sarcastic tone. You really weren't satisfied with my psychotic genocidal aunt from another timeline? You really had to go off and make someone worse than her? No one ever got the chance to reply. At that moment, a harsh and cold voice cut through the darkness. I think that's the first time you've ever acknowledged our familial relationship. Thank you, Varian. Someone as intelligent as you must really be my nephew. Team Marisol halted in their tracks. Weapons were drawn, and Callie's crew formed a protective ring around the creations. Marisol was the first one to spot the newcomer. There she is! Over there! She's under the Qatar Airways plane! Akira Robinson was leaning against the landing gear of a Boeing Dreamliner, watching Team Marisol as they went by. She was so far away that she must have used telepathy to magnify her voice enough to be heard. You! Varian shouted. Mina suddenly lunged forward, trying to reach Akira, but Trig and Varian grabbed her. Akira, help me! Mina screamed. I've got to get back to Malum! Conti tightened her grip on Marisol's shoulders and gestured toward Mina. There, there it is! Conti said. Somehow, Malam Ralpakin still has a hold on her. We've got bigger problems than that, Marisol replied. That's Akira over there. Akira let go of the Dreamliner and started to walk toward Team Marisol, speaking as she went. Relax, I'm not here to fight you. If anything, I'm here to offer my help. Like hell you are, Blake and Varian yelled simultaneously. Back off! What are you talking about? Mina screamed. He's the enemy! Akira was close enough that she did not need to raise her voice anymore. Callie's team was now aiming their weapons at her chest and face, waiting for the order to fire. Listen to me, Akira said. She was speaking past the group, directly to Blake. I don't want to save your life. It's true. But this crisis is bigger than all of us. We have to defeat Malum. He's the real threat. I can prove it. Let me break his little spell on Mina. Mina began to spiral out of control. She was fighting against two SWAT operatives holding her, screaming loudly. Again? Really? Mina shrieked at Akira. How many times are you going to reject his love, Akira? Malum's using the same brainwashing as in Song of the Solitaire? Marisol said. Unfortunately, her voice was lost amidst the growing tumult. Trig, Conti, and Sebakira were starting to emit powerful psionic auras. They were stealing themselves for a fight. On the other hand, Ashling and Emily were yelling for Varian to shut up and let her talk. If she is against Malum, then she is no longer our enemy, Ashling was saying. Shouldn't she at least get the chance to prove herself? Callie had positioned herself between Blake and Akira. After a moment, Marisol found herself doing the same. Akira is dangerous, Marisol shouted to the group. Ally to none, an enemy of all, remember? A dark look passed over Akira's face. That's what I was like in Faith in Chaos, Akira said, invoking the name of the book where she made her first appearance in the Stormbreaker universe. I am not that girl anymore. I am becoming my own woman in this world, one who can help you if you just give me the chance. Emily stood on tiptoe and loudly projected her voice to the group. We should listen. I don't sense anything evil from her, and neither does the fairy. Plus, she was so kind to me when she brought me into the real world. At least let me repay her for that. Akira looked at Emily and said, Thank you. It was the metaphorical straw that broke the camel's back. Varian lost all of his or her composure. 
she or he rounded on Emily with an expression of newfound revulsion and horror on their face. After half a second of hesitation, Varian yelled, Okay, time for you to shut up! Varian raised one hand and punched Emily in the face. She keeled over backwards and collapsed into Blake's arms. Before Marisol could do or say anything, violence erupted around her as Trig and Ashling suddenly lunged at Varian. Sebakira and Conti quickly came to her or his defense, and a brawl broke out on the tarmac as the creations violently tore into one another. <laughs>